Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Welcome to the Global Town Hall. On the last Sunday of every month, Project Save the World invites activists everywhere in the world to call in by Zoom for a general conversation about whatever is on our minds as we try to repair the world. So this is uh, the 31st of January, 2021. And we have a number of friends who've uh, gathered on my screen to have a good visit. And the first person who is talking as we join the group is Franklin Griffiths, retired professor at the University of Toronto. Franklin, let's go. Uh, uh, my uh, preoccupation at the moment is with permafrost thawing. Thawing of permafrost in the Arctic and its uh, capacity to produce great amounts of CO2 and also methane. And uh, the methane, of course, and CO2 are greenhouse gases. And we are in a carbon feedback loop uh, for real. How big, uh, though, it's going to be and how fast this loop will develop, how rapidly is uh, yet to be determined. So it's difficult for governments to really, and, and indeed societies and activists, I think, to really have a good fix on this problem as yet, as of yet. But potentially, it could be very, very, very serious in that the, uh, the methane in particular that's going to be released could come rapidly and could overcome uh, or dilute a large amount of human endeavor to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As we try to reduce, 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 uh, the, green, the permafrost may produce ever larger amounts of greenhouse gas and nullify our effects. This would be uh, discouraging, if you might put it mildly. So I'm concerned about what we might do and how this whole uh, problem might be resolved or at least dealt with. And this, by the way, spills over into the question of, uh, of clathrates. These are uh, another form of uh, methane that's found in frozen in, fr in frozen water offshore uh, in the Arctic countries, offshore of Northern Russia, great amounts of it, I believe, in, uh, in the Laptev Sea and other North Siberian Sea, sorry, the East Siberian, where the uh, methane arises uh, from the water in plumes, not merely bubbles. And you can light it, and you can have uh, fire in the dark on a, on a quiet uh, evening. Anyway, this is what uh, concerns me at the, at the moment. And to be very brief about it, my thought is that Canada should take an initiative and invite the United States, but first of all, Russia, to uh, take the initiative in the Arctic Council to uh, study and uh, get an initial fix on the magnitude and speed of the problem, especially for for methane, and then to take the assessment out to the wider <laughs> world to get attention to do something. Wonderful! I'm so glad you brought that up, Frank. You can't tell. I can't tell you how apropos it is. I just have exchanged emails in the last twenty minutes with the professor Peter Wadhams. Of, uh, I believe, he's a friend of mine. Is he? Yeah. He's in uh, Turin, Italy. And I've arranged, or I'm in the business of arranging an interview with him about class go. rates and permafrost, but mostly right. about class rates, right? He's, he has uh, re, uh, pu published something quite sh shocking recently, um, uh, certainly some, a lot to worry about uh, yeah. in those terms. So um, I will uh, publicize this in advance as soon as I know. My best guess is that uh, I will uh, have an interview with him on the 11th of February at mm. 12.30 uh, on our uh, cell, uh, our uh, YouTube uh, channel. YouTube.com slash C slash to save the world. And it's C as in channel. And unfortunately, the computer rebooted earlier, so it did go offline, but it was up for several weeks prior to this. So if you look this evening, it should be back online. And I'll post a link in the chat on this call as well. And we will uh, we will put put up this uh, global town hall 
uh, online as well. So you can see yourself tomorrow or the next day as soon as I get it done and put it up. Uh, but at any rate, the point is that Peter Wadham is quite an authority on, uh, on the clathrates and the, and the methane threat. Yes, he is. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, that conversation. Um, thank you so much, Frank. Yeah. yeah. Okay, be back in touch. Yeah, so here comes Barbara Burkett. Now, somebody else, was it Glenn? Who Take Frank's approach of having Canada and Russia start to make sense at the Arctic level. And it might be good to include some other smart countries that have Arctic connection. Norway, Sweden, and Finland are nations that have good sense and they would be good allies to work with Frank and Canada <laughs> and Russia to help build some Arctic uh, unity. I've also reached out to a, a, sci a scientific research group. Um, I don't think Frank is here anymore. He's gone probably, but in Norway, and they have a staff of something like a dozen people, professional people doing uh, research. So it's obviously a major research outfit on the, um, the Arctic uh, ice and, um, and, and melting clathrates. Clathrates being kind of a, a frozen uh, crystals made of hydrogen, uh, or rather uh, methane and uh, water. Um, so uh, um, go ahead, well, I think it's a good time for you, um, Glenn, to give us a little bit of the story about what you're up to these days. Thanks. Um I'm conducting workshops. Uh, I have a series of six workshops that I've devised and I've conducted the series of six a number of times. Uh, today I'll do it again and I, it actually I won't need to leave today's session with you folks early because there's a, uh, when your session is scheduled to end, I can just jump right into my next series of workshops. But I got active in, in the peace movement in the 1960s and in very multi-issue ways, peace, social justice, all the good issues. And um, I'm conducting workshops for people of all ages who want to develop their skills and resources for doing nonviolent grassroots organizing. All the issues that we care about are made worse by people who have political and economic power and cultural uh, dominance that inhibit human rights and interfere with peace, interfere with solving the climate crisis, fixing the economy and all of that. So I've been doing workshops, uh, recognize that nonviolence not only needs to be the goal that we seek, but the method of how we get there. And, and so my series of six workshops helps people strategize how to make progress on big long-term issues like changing foreign policy, uh, solving the problems of our dysfunctional economic system, taking care of the climate, all these things, and using good methods for how to strategize, do outreach, bring people into the movement, and so forth. And so uh, when as soon as uh, Meta's uh, session here ends today, I need to jump into my, war my Zoom uh, workshop on uh, the next episode of that session. And uh, uh, I invite people to do this. I've done this with people of all ages, from the 80s all the way down to high school students. Where and it's very user-friendly. Where are you? I'm, I'm in uh, the Olympia, Washington area, but we have people from every place. I have a couple of my people from New York City, and we've had people from elsewhere as well. Uh, Glenn, I would suggest that you put your uh, your URL or web web connection or whatever in the chat. I'll, box. I'll put an email and phone number in the chat. Thanks. In the chat box, everybody can copy things down and and be in touch with each other if you're willing to. All right, thank you. Very good. Okay, hi Joseph Sampaya. I'm glad you made it to us back. Uh, Joseph is in uh, Burundi, right? Say hi, Joseph. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, how are you all? All right. I'll tell you what, I did I did say that since you, you got some issues, you might have to leave too. Maybe now let's start off by letting you tell uh, the world about the various uh, wonderful deeds, good deeds that you're doing for the poor people of Burundi and, and in Africa in general. You're, you're a pastor. You live part of the time in Finland. I know that. And you spend a lot of your time in Africa mm -hmm. trying to help us improve uh, African agriculture. 
small farmers. Is that right? Joseph, can you give us a talk a little bit about what you want to... I, um, I just live in Finland uh, with the organization called the Reach Unreached. The Reach, the Reach the Unreached? Is that the name of the organization? Reach the Unreached? Uh, but the organization is operating some community development project in East Africa, in Burundi and Tanzania. Uh, I think this is, my, this is my second, if I remember well, is my second trip to join the meeting. Mm -hmm. we, we have, as we discussed and as I mentioned in my email, uh, I, I think in my two emails, we based in Finland and operating uh, the community development project in the East Africa, in Burundi and Tanzania. Right now, I am in Burundi for over one one and a half a month, and uh, I was. Go ahead, Rose, if you'd like. Yeah, okay. I'm uh, just to kind of uh, curious to, um, uh, uh, Franklin's gone, but to pick up on uh, the discussion that uh, he started on what's happening in the Arctic, um, I'm wondering um, uh, how people feel about some of the recent initiatives uh, out of the White House. Uh, Biden signed a number of executive orders in the last uh, um, week or so. I, I, I just heard John Kerry interviewed by Fareed Zakir on CNN. Um, about um, uh, how, he didn't mention the Arctic specifically, but uh, uh, seemed uh, very positive about uh, things moving forward. Hmm. But the, the number of countries, of course, that have to cooperate, Canada included, and there's also been an awful lot of coverage in the Globe and Mail, certainly, which is a paper I read every day, uh, uh, on uh, um, how Canada is going to have to up its game to keep up with uh, some of the um, uh, initiatives that have been put in place. I mean, of course, the Keystone Pipeline is uh, uh, plaguing us, uh, the, the cancellation, and um, uh, Alberta's reaction to it or specifically uh, Kenny's, but uh, there are other uh, um, uh, things that uh, evidently Canada needs to uh, uh, become a little more assertive on. And I'm just wondering uh, what other people think of that. Well, of course, Kerry is the guy who's now going to be in charge of global warming in the U.S., all yeah. of their efforts on climate change, which I guess is a good sign, not that he... As far as I know, he's, he's never ever been a great expert on that, but, but he certainly has a profile so that, and he's got commitment to it now. So if he really pushes hard, I think he can get more done than some of the newcomers might be able to, don't you think? And now you seem to take it for granted that the Globe and Mail is right in saying that it's a terrible thing for Canada to lose the, the, the loss, the fact that Biden is not going to approve the Keystone Pipeline. Oh, no, no. The Globe is, uh, the uh, journalists I read in the Globe are very much in favor of cancellation and critical of Kenny. Okay. All right. Uh, Good. And that he uh, put too many eggs in one basket. He he was gambling with taxpayers' money. He should have known that it uh, it wouldn't come through if Kenny or if uh, Biden won the election and and so on. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, the 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 I work with a group called Just Earth, uh, which you're familiar with, Meta, um, started at uh, University of Guelph by Lynn uh, McDonald, and our focus. And I think that uh, most of the environmental movement, climate action network, is, and various groups that come under that umbrella is to um, um, uh, improve and strengthen the uh, Bill C-12, uh, which is the, the Climate Accountability Act that is being uh, debated at the moment. It's just passed second reading. And uh, uh, there are um, um, uh, certain uh, things that uh, uh, some of us would very much like to see uh, strengthened, one of them being accountability 
from the government uh, or, or a report uh, on how, how close we are or are not to meeting our targets by 2025 instead of 2030. That's what's in there now. And um, a, a good, strong uh, um, advisory board that's independent and, and made up of climate scientists. We don't want any oil executives on it, retired oil executives. And um, ideally, um, a sort of a, a czar on climate or a, an envoy, somebody like Teresa Tam, who is uh, the spokesperson for the medical community on COVID right now, if we had somebody like that on the environment, that might uh, uh, push uh, public awareness uh, on the urgency of these problems uh, in the Arctic as well as uh, in other areas as well. That's interesting. And so the, uh, you would want somebody more than the environment minister. Uh, yes, yeah, I think so. As, as somebody that uh, the environment minister or the prime minister or anybody calls on to uh, to give us a regular update on uh, um, various aspects of uh, climate uh, um, uh, issues, how we're doing. Uh -huh. how, what do the other people think about that? Think that would help? Anybody? Okay. Well, we can move on if you don't, if there's no response. Volker, were you about to say something or somebody was, I can't remember who. Betty Jane. Betty Jane. Oh, where are you, Betty Jane? Here. Anyway, here. hello, go for it. <laughs> I don't know how to put up my hand on my little oh, yeah. um, I, I don't know. Somebody else remind me how to tell people to put their hands up uh, with the, the, you know, the, the machine instead of just waving. You uh, click on the bottom where it says reactions, you'll see an option to raise and lower your hand if you're I'm on a on computer the laptop, interface. I'm not on an Android. Oh, oh uh, I, I'm not certain in that regard. Then you might have that option if you try clicking and holding on your screen, but I'm not 100% certain for the mobile devices. Mm -hmm. Clicking and holding on my screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Now, Hannah and Catherine have their hands up, but Betty Jane, you had, you had yours up physically, so you get first. <laughs> well, I just have a comment that millions are presumably going to be spent on carbon sequestration to produce carbon net zero housing. And um, rather than using nature because they maintain that um, it would take years to grow the forests. And of course, once the forests are grown, they'd be cut down anyhow. So I, mean, I don't understand that philosophy. Uh, go on. I, I'm not sure what uh, you, you need to explain a little more for me what you have in mind. <clears throat> well, one alternative to um, reducing grease, greenhouse gases is to sequester them, mm -hmm. to put them on, in the soil. Mm -hmm. And one of the best ways, best methods to sequester carbon is to put them in trees and plants, mm -hmm. which I think is the best and the safest method. Mm -hmm. But because of the urgency, certain um, uh, geo uh, structural um, situations have been developed by engineers around the world to harness carbon dioxide from the uh, from the atmosphere. And uh, one of the ways is to produce buildings that have concrete that don't produce carbon dioxide. Now millions are being spent on that and I don't know how efficient it would be because it seems to me with the population growing, there's more need for housing and the housing being put up is not um, net, um, net carbon zero. Um, it, it should have a, uh, it should, should have an, a, large, a large amount of greenery around it and I don't think consideration has been made for that. That's my point. Okay, I can refer you uh, to a new book, uh, which will be, uh, there's a book launch on Wednesday by Derek Paul. I can't remember the title of his book, but it's the second edition of a book he has about the uh, economics, global economics. And in my conversation with him the other day, I asked him, did he change his mind about anything between writing the first edition and the second? And he said, yes, he thinks that uh, he has his different ideas about carbon, uh, about cement, concrete. And, uh, and his angle on it is that 
the worst of the problem about making concrete is not so much the release of CO2 in the process, but the fact that you have to heat stuff so much and that raising the temperature to that extent it requires a, a whole lot of burning of, uh, of things that produce that that produce um, uh, you know carbon uh, into the atmosphere. So have a look at that book if you can catch the uh, yeah. look it up. Derek Paul and his I can't remember the title. Somebody yeah. else might yeah. remember. Yeah. Also, just on that point, uh, uh, there was um, uh, something in the Globe and Mail about carbon being injected uh, into uh, a cement building, as, as you pointed out. But uh, uh, for building purposes, the architects are increasingly moving in the uh, direction of using timber, a, a form of wood that uh, uh, would be structurally, uh, uh, would it be as strong as steel. And, and so that that's one way of, of substituting. Uh, uh, cement, which is pretty carbon intensive uh, mm -hmm. uh, on the whole. Good, thank you. Yeah, and there are people who claim to have uh, invented better ways of making concrete without the emissions, mm -hmm. not from the from the heating, but from you know this chemical reaction that goes on when you put is it limestone or I don't know something in there. Oh, I'm uh, hogging the mic when I've got two hands up, and uh, Catherine, let's call on Catherine next. Yes. Hi everyone. I'm I'm happy to be here again, and I'm here for a short time. I, I have a Zoom limit today. I've been on Zoom for two hours, and but I did want to pop by, and it's nice to see Hannah here from Voice of Women as well. The two things that I just want to mention, I have put in the chat, and the first one is that there is a um, website, the campaign against the the fighter jets. Uh, the 88 fighter jet contract that the government is playing with right now. And I think it, it's very informative. There's a, there's a group of people meeting regularly on this issue. So please check that out. The website is in the chat. And the other is that the uh, petition that is still open to encourage a debate about the ban treaty, the nuclear ban treaty. And uh, if you can share that with your networks, it'd be wonderful. Uh, we hope uh, well, Elizabeth May is going to present it. There are over 2,000 signatures, but we are hoping for more. It was uh, started by Nancy Covington, Dr. Covington, here in, in Mi'kma'ki in Nova Scotia. So, um, and I think all of our issues tie in together. Thank you. And uh, also, I'm, I don't know whether I'm free to mention this because there, it is, I'm not coordinating it, but Erica Simpson uh, holds uh, every Friday night at, I think it's 7 o'clock, Erica Simpson holds a Zoom meeting for people who are interested in working on the ban treaty, Canadians in particular. So I, I don't have the URL and it is a, a private meeting. I, I don't know, some people are worried about having spies or so, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's private. You should, if you wanna uh, be in on it, you should call Erica Simpson and you can get it from, uh, you know, from Google. E R I K Simpson at University of Western Ontario. Thank, Thank you very much, Meta. I just hope I hope people can share the 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 petition for signature, and I will see you again another time. Thank you. Yep. Good for you to be here and show up. Bye. Okay, Hannah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Or at least this morning here in Vancouver, where I'm uh, 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 situated at now. And I appreciate the uh, issues that are being uh, raised around the climate. Uh, very, very big, very urgent. Um, however, what um, I'm, uh, I'll just comment first of all on the replacement for cement. The industry that is taking off and is actually quite active are um, the building is uh, using hemp. And folks are, uh, um, um, yeah, they, they're companies that have successfully um, done building with uh, hemp blocks as opposed to cement. Mm -hmm. I, that I, uh, I was really impressed when I first learned about it. And um, I think that's, that's really fantastic. But of course, large amounts, uh, there's a company in Calgary who basically is just purchasing all the hemp that's available that's being uh, being grown in, in places of Canada and so on. Anyway, but my, I'm mostly about a question. 
and that pertains to the billions in subsidies that the uh, government is directing to the oil oil companies. So, um, are there uh, any uh, actions that anyone knows about, or perhaps some lobbying efforts, and or otherwise that uh, we might, and I'm particularly interested, um, engage in, in, in raising this really uh, critical issue of the billions in subsidies. Thank you. Thank you. And if, does anybody have an answer for her? Yeah. I know, I, that uh, there, I know of some organizations that are working in Europe, but I, uh, you might get in touch with Alan Ware, Hannah, if you have his, um, his connection. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, that's great. He, yeah, I think he can help you uh, put you in touch with people who are working on um, the subsidies that um, I was told by uh, somebody who should know, and I believe I verified it, that something like $5 trillion a year worldwide go into subsidies of the fossil fuel industries. Uh, just imagine stupendous amount uh, that is uh, spent in that way. So uh, at any rate, it's, it's such a shocking thing that using our pocketbook as a way of protesting is just a wonderful opportunity and hooray for you for bringing it up. Yeah, I meant just Earth does all the time. I think in Climate Action Network uh, uh, protest against in letters to various politicians against the subsidies. I can put that in the chat. Oh yes, you have a, a link or something, Rose? Is it? Sure, I'll, I, I will. Okay, Thanks. I see Marie Laura uh, Collet is uh, raising your hand. Welcome. <laughs> just thank you. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, Biden, one of the uh, executive order that he's signing and the direction he's going is to cut the, all the subsidies to the petroleum uh, associations and all the um, uh, carbon. So this, I think, is a good sign because that means that our government is probably going to go in the same direction, maybe a bit later. But I think that the United States has quite a weight uh, in uh, our future uh, decisions. I think that is a good sign. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Betty Jane. Well, the government says it wants to transitionalize from fossil fuels to one particular fossil fuel, namely gas. And uh, Wilkinson was on the agenda the other day in Toronto. Uh, and apparently he had spent his first 20 years dealing with clear energy. So it seems as if it's a matter of political will rather than uh, technology. And Wilkinson is who again? Wilkinson. The environment. He's the environment, environment minister yes. now? In yeah. Canada, yes. Uh, okay, I lost track. Can't keep up with all of them. Thank you. Garth, I don't know you very well. Why don't you let us get acquainted with you? What do you have to say about the world? <laughs> yes, no, you wouldn't know me. I've uh, I've only reconnected in the last uh, two or three months. I have uh, done mostly my I've done advocacy for refugees and affordable housing, but it's always been through the Anglican Church of Canada. So it's only been um, in the last three or four months that I've decided to reconnect around peace issues. I used to belong to the Canadian Peace Alliance, but so I'm. I'm trying to get up to speed, shall we say, mm -hmm. in terms of, of uh, who's doing what and what actions are being taken. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's where I'm coming from. I live in Ottawa. Good. All right. Actually, I live, I live in Gatineau. Oh, oh yes, that's that's in Quebec, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joe Howard Haynes. Yes. Tell me about life. All right, I'm going to tell you a brief story of how human beings can get together on common ground, regardless of their pre predilections and different realms. And that's an organization I co-founded called the Peterborough Pollinators. <clears throat> and as you probably know, one of the crises that we're facing is the 
reduction in the in the population of pollinators. Mm-hmm. So what we've done is we've had this huge. Sorry, let me interrupt you. Yeah, I've, I, we hear about bees, but are you saying that there are other pollinators that are also? Uh, God, yeah, the po- the monarch butterfly. We had a monarch butterfly run from Peterborough to uh, the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico. And it, it was really exhilarating because there were stops all along the way. I mean, it was a fly-by-night venture. We had no, very little outside funding and people ran all along the way. They ran. They ran. And, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a marathon. And, and maybe there'd be somebody that, that ran 50 kilometers or 10 or 20, whatever. Uh, and it was, uh, there's a film being made now by our local filmmaker, Rodney Fuentes. And so there's going to be, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's totally exhilarating because it means that everybody can be involved. And I'll tell you just one little component that I'm particularly involved in which is the garden called Seasonal Infinities. Seasonal Infinities garden is based on the shape of the infinity sign and it's planted so that uh, pollinating plants blossom in season along the curves of the infinity sign. And, and um, I, several years ago, I, I organized a couple of people to get and we passed a local ban on pesticides. Well, now, because we didn't follow up properly, there's a lot of pesticide use in where I live, which I call Lumberjack Junction. Uh, there's a disrespect for trees as well. We got to learn these things, you know. I mean, it's a learning process for all of us. We can't make judgments. But so anyway, um, I organ. Uh, uh, what's happening is there are a few people in the neighborhood who are coming together, and the model. Uh, pollinator garden will be launched depending on COVID. COVID willing, we could say, in the spring. COVID willing. <laughs> and you know, I mean, what's great about this is that no matter what devastation, God knows we've got plenty on, on in the field, don't we? It, here's something that people, anybody can do. I mean, everybody can put a pollinator plant in the ground and make a difference and watch the beautiful monarch butterfly and and plus of course the transformational process that the butterfly itself goes through from the from the egg on the on the milkweed plant to the caterpillar to the chrysalis to the um, i mean come on that's fantastic (laughs) the emergence of this gorgeous creature if anybody can be failed to move by that i don't know it's it's just so so anyway i'm well okay now you've already educated me number one i didn't know that the monarch butterflies were big in pollination i thought we had that we liked them just because they're so pretty but i didn't know they were important too to our to our food supply are are they a significant source of pollination? oh god yes yes they're top of them yeah. No and, you know, here's a, here's another interesting, I won't go on too long, but I just want to throw in this all along the way, you know, the, the journey of the run was just, wow, what a journey it was because of course they ran through the United States and devastating monocultures, just unbelievable. But when they got to Mexico, it, it, it was the day of the dead celebration. And on oh, the day wow. of the dead celebration in, in uh, Mexico, the, the honored living creature is the monarch butterfly because wow. they believe that the monarch butterfly carries the spirit of the ancestors. So, wow. I mean, my God, on so many fronts, this thing is thrilling. Just thrilling. Yeah, I uh, know, but they, they live on milkweed, don't they? Yes, yes. Now, what else are we supposed to do besides milkweed? You say plant a pollinator plant. What else is there? Well, there's bee balm. There's a whole bunch. I mean, you go online and you'll find out what pollinator plants is a wonderful sources. Um, no, but besides, no, it's just bees and monarch butterflies, or are there other? Oh inf- my God! There's bees, beetles, bugs, oh. uh, birds. There's hummingbirds are also pollinators. There are many, many creatures that are pollinators. But if we don't protect our pollinators, 
-hmm. We don't have food. That's it's that simple. Uh -huh. And the fact that those populations are declining is is really concerning. You uh, bet. And, yeah. and, and, and and but it you know here's the thing that's exhilarating about the process and creative is that it's something that I mean about the methane in in, in the Arctic. Holy Hannah, what can we do? But about the, the there's something we can do. And once we start to find that we have agency, personal agency, then our own intelligence and our creative spirit, all of those things, the most valuable qualities of the human species come into play. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's, that's what I'm witnessing. Okay, and if there's anything, I live in a high rise mm -hmm. with a balcony. And I've pretty much given off up gardening on my balcony because I'm too old. But I'll be glad to go out and plant a, a pollinator if you think there's something good I could do. Do they do, uh, pollinator plants live on balconies of high-rise buildings? Well, do an experiment and see. And tell everybody <laughs> what you're doing, Meta. Tell everybody tell me. what you're doing. Tell everybody the story. And, and, mm -hmm. and then people will not feel that they're excluded from activism because they don't know enough i mean oh, I'd, I'd love to you know yeah. they can join in yeah thank and, you and, and, yeah, I, I, that's I'm, I'm so glad you informed me i bet everybody learned something just now from you right there's an endless amount to be learned <laughs> and every time you see the emer you know a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis it's like it's a spiritual experience i mean and every it's an intellectual it's all of those mm -hmm. things it's phenomenal. Uh, my little grandson, Salvador, <laughs> they had some that they nurtured inside. Oh. And I will never forget him holding a, a butterfly that had just emerged from a chrysalis. The butterfly didn't want to leave right away. <laughs> you know, you there's a, a wonderful graphic. I wish I could find it quickly enough. And I'd put it up on a screen share. But it's uh, somebody, you know, this meme that's gone on about uh, Bernie Sanders at the inauguration where yes. he's there wearing his mittens, you know, and That's everybody right. is now taking a picture of Bernie and putting it in various places. Like in one place, he's up on the Sistine Chapel touching the hand of God or so mm -hmm. he's doing but he's, in a, but he's in a caterpillar. Well, he's, that's right. He's, there's, a, there's a wonderful one where she's taken the hands and made a whole bunch of them, you know. So the, there's a there's a long Bernie Sanders that's a moniker butterfly caterpillar with his right. hands folded, and those are like his legs. <laughs> would that would that we could be transformative like the like the monarch is. Thank you so much, Joe. That's You're true. Uh, hey, Meta, you have plant pots on your balcony, so I can get you some seeds for pollinator-friendly plants and plant them out there in the warmer weather. Absolutely. And then Gordana and I can water them, yeah. Yeah. Adam Beautiful. comes here and does good deeds for me. I, I honestly wouldn't be able to function without Adam. He is uh, just completely essential for me. And not only solving my computer problems, but things like <laughs> planting flowers on my balcony or, you know, changing my light bulbs. He does good deeds when he comes. Thank you so much, Adam. So, oh yes, here's David Miller. Hello, David. How are you? I'm fine. And um, I put a number of comments in chat to uh, flesh out some of the uh, questions that were being asked. So I don't need to repeat all that. I would like to ask you, Meta, if you could put in chat or ask Adam to put in chat uh, some reference to Pastor Joseph's organization in Burundi. I know some people, some Quaker, uh, African Quakers, who might be able to uh, work with him. Wonderful. Yes. Well, now, uh, Adam, you're going to be able to find it from, from Airtable, I believe. So if you put that in there, and of course, Pastor Joseph may be back, popping up and down. You know, he just comes in and out. Um, but and he's uh, talk, so if you could put it in chat, that would help. Yes. Well, he certainly does good work in terms of going around and trying to organize uh, farmers. And here we have Charles Tauber. Hello, Charles. Nice to see you again. Hi, good evening. How are you guys? Do, you're, I recognize your background. I know where you are. You're in Vukovar, Croatia, aren't you? That's correct. That's, That's right. Okay. 
a very snowy Vukovar, Croatia right now. That's what uh, Volker says it's snowing in Germany too. Well, it snowed here, but it's not doing it now. So how are things in Vukovar? Oh, pretty awful. Um, pretty awful, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole situation with migrants uh, in Northwest Bosnia in particular, but uh, also in Serbia is abominable. Um, and in Greece as well. Uh, <coughs> in, Greece? You say Greece as well? Yes, in Greece as well. I got a call this morning from uh, somebody in uh, on one of the islands who was saying that there is flooding down there, lots of wind, very cold, that uh, the roofs of the tents are being blown off, so everybody is cold and wet. Uh, they're issuing... Uh, residence permits, uh, not virtually not at all. It's even worse in Bosnia where that camp was burned down a couple of weeks ago. Um, the international organizations and the NGOs have absolutely no idea of what they're doing. Mm. So it's the whole, uh, there's no psychological assistance available. Uh, so in other words, it's disaster for these people. How could you even do therapy if you're sitting in the snow with your ne your tent collapsed around you? My God, you know, first things first, I think, just plain survival, it sounds like. There's a lot of, that's exactly. And what uh, we have one guy down there, or he's now back in Germany, but uh, he was down there for a couple of weeks. And he was saying that, the NGOs who are going in there, um, the NGOs have absolutely no idea of what they're doing. They're not getting any training. They're not willing to get trained. Uh, they're not getting any supervision, psychological supervision, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're getting, well, all those people are also getting secondarily traumatized. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they're freaking out. And yeah. I Let think, me introduce I think Volker Beck. You know, Charles, I, I, you didn't announce exactly here that you are a psychotherapist and that yeah. you specialize in treating people who've been through horrible war situations, conflicts, right? Right. Volker Beck is a professor of psychology at uh, what, it's a university in Darmstadt, Germany, which is near Frankfurt. And uh, he's a specialist in uh, therapy, therapy for, or psychology of oncology, people with cancer. Uh, oh, but I bet you have contacts, don't you, Volker, with, with other people who do therapy for, in, in other settings, uh, disaster situations and so on. Is there mm -hmm. any, any way that you maybe have any, any contact relationships that might inform these people who are working in, in uh, Greece and, and other places that are in, in such tragic situations. Yes, yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, of course, I have contacts to uh, organizations and persons and, and therapists here in, in Germany, and maybe I can support and help uh, you, David. Uh, Volker, you I'm putting... Me if you want, directly. Yeah, uh, Volker, I'm putting... Um my email and our website on the chat so yeah, super okay i'm going to send you an email with my address please do so we can exchange it exactly you. super are there uh, can i speak german so we can and in fact we have a good group in Würzburg, which is okay which uh, you is, mentioned you mentioned this last meeting yeah exactly. in yeah so this is so my email and uh, website. Are yep, I've got it. Great. Thank you. And uh, let's be in touch because th there could be some interesting yeah, super. stuff okay. that we could do in Germany. Yeah. And it's not all that far from here. Uh, it's about a thousand kilometers. Yeah, it's not so far. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And I do speak German, so. Yeah, super. 
I was about to uh, to exchange a little information with David Miller. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have these uh, daily, nowadays I'm doing daily talk shows and we have a, um, a YouTube channel of our own. It's like owning your own television station. It's just a wonderful feeling. So uh, we broadcast every day a, a new talk show. And I'll tell you later about some of the talk shows that I'm working to produce maybe next week. Um, but uh, Joseph, uh, uh, David Miller uh, in Montreal has had, was the one who thought this up. He said, you should also, if you can, how about transcribing them and making the test text available for all of these shows? I think some people would find it more convenient to read a, you know, man, a text uh, than, than to watch a whole uh, video. So he's been working on one. And I have found uh, somebody else, a friend of mine in Vienna, who's going to work on him too. So what we are doing, and uh, Adam is uh, the mastermind for this as well. We have a program that, believe it or not, will make a transcript for you of uh, the audio uh, track for a, a, a video. So we, we send, a, we upload our video and it makes a, um, a script for us. Um, but of course it has a lot of mistakes in it because it doesn't recognize people's names and well, a lot of things that need to be fixed. So it takes about an hour after I make um, each show for a person to go through and clean it up and make it look uh, reasonably uh, intelligible. And uh, David has been doing that. And I have another woman friend in uh, Vienna who's going to do some for me. But we have a whole backlog, you know, going back. By now, we have about 175 shows that have been made in the past. I'm not going to try to get them all transcribed. But if anybody feels an urge to trans to not do the transcription, because the machine will do that for you, but take about an hour or maybe a little less to um, to clean it up, you know, to fix the punctuation and and if, if something doesn't make sense, you realize it has to be somebody's name or something like that, that it's mis, misinterpreted. And so you have to look it up and, and put the right name in. And uh, it has the sound there. So you can listen to it while you're doing it, if you want. Uh, or I just go ahead and do it by the looks of it. And I think, well, if I can read it, it's good enough. But it's when I find I, I can't read it that I have to intervene and I listen to what the person said. And usually I can make out what it was and fix it. So if anybody has some free time and you want to spend, donate some time uh, transcribing old uh, videos for me, um, that would be just terrific. So send me uh, in your chat box if you're willing to try it. Uh, we'll, um, we'll reach out, reach back to you and, um, and offer you a chance to, you know, to clean it up for me. So we'll have some transcripts on our website as well. Okay. There, now I've made my pitch. So thank you, David Miller, for proposing the thing and for doing the first one. You just did one that take, you said you spent four hours doing it because you did it by hand. And there's an easier way we can do it. <laughs> thank you. Mary Grow, you haven't said a peep. Let's hear from you. Yeah. Okay. What are you up to? Well, I mean, uh, the thing that bothers me is the amount of money that governments around the world spend on uh, armaments and they sell them to each other and somebody's making money and people are dying on account of it. And uh, I wish we could do something more about it than we seem to be able to do. Mm. I mean, Conscience Canada has been trying for years to think that maybe withholding taxes or military spending might help, but the government isn't paying any attention and that's partly because there are so few people that are able to actually do that or willing to so the government keeps on giving money i don't know where does the money come from for these military companies does it come from the government i guess the government buys the arms like they're going to buy these ships and these airplanes are going to spend millions Billions, isn't it, on the uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, air 
and it was plate of air, air AD, ADH fighter. Mm -hmm. Imagine Canada needing fighter jets and uh, needing 88. And uh, it's going to be millions of dollars in the cost of them and then in uh, keeping them up and going for the next, for their lifetime. Meanwhile, all of that money is not going to good causes that it should be going to. It's mm -hmm. just a complete waste and not only a waste, but if they actually get into some action, people will be killed. I mean, that's what the military is for, isn't it? <sighs> Majority of our arms spending is being given to Saudi Arabia, which is killing civilians in Yemen. Yemen is a really, really difficult situation. So sad and nobody pays any attention, it seems like. So anyway, that's what we keep on thinking we must do something about this military armament production. Change the government, make it responsible and accountable and transparent. It seems like no government that comes in does anything different. They talk, but they don't act. And when they act, they act in, in against nor, uh, usual taxpayers' interests. The average person's inequality is getting worse. The haves are, getting, have, are having more and the have-nots have even less in the world in general. I think it must be, um, must be um, lobbyists, uh, <clears throat> very industrialists that convince the government. I don't know, do they pay the government money, I suppose, and then the government thinks they have to go along with it. And that must apply to all the governments around the world because uh, we don't have to hate each other so much and kill each other so much. Oh. So I don't know what the best solution is for people mm -hmm. to get some action on this. The developers are pushing growth. And uh, I feel that in, in terms of city councils and municipalities, developers should not give funds for elections of people on councils. And they should pay their due taxes as well. That should be enforced. I have a question for Mary Grove. Yes. Uh, there used to be a publication called Defense Monitor, which went into considerable detail on all of these issues and track down who was doing the lobbying and pressures from the United States and what was believable or unbelievable about the claims that were being made. Is there any successor to that publication? Well, I don't know whether there is any successor to the publication. I think the, uh, there are peace tax publications, but I don't know how much detail they provide on that sort of information. We have a person in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, who's studying a doctor's uh, philosophy, a doctor studies on the military spending, Tamara Lawrence, and she has this, these facts and information which she shares quite willingly. And uh, yeah. Yeah. so- they, it, they, Go ahead, they, David, the defense monitor merged into another nonprofit organization. And right now, I don't remember if it was the uh, Project on Governmental Oversight, POGO, P-O-G-O, Project on Governmental Oversight, or if it was uh, Government Accountability Project, G-A-P. But the Defense Monitor, and I used to subscribe to that for decades, and they merged into one of those organizations um, that, that fulfills a, a similar purpose. Yeah, that's the U.S. publication. There was also yeah. a Canadian one. Oh, okay. I don't know about the Canadian one. I'm I'm in the states. I recall there was an organization called the Toronto uh, Disarmament Committee, which was quite prominent back in the '60s and '70s in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I see a question here from Mary from Rose again. Rose Dyson, any comments on the? growing trends regarding divestments, investments within the financial community on ethical social governance issues? Uh, I think that's uh, an important question, Rose. And 
if people, uh, Glenn, you, are you? Yes, was that a, yes. There, yeah. There's a lot of effort underway uh, related to the climate crisis and nuclear weapons, at least in the States. Um, I live in the States, uh, about 60 miles south of Seattle. And uh, there's an organization called Don't Bank on the Bomb that's trying to get people in the States to pull their money out of any banks that yeah. finance anything to do with nuclear weapons. And also not just the banks, but insurance companies put a lot of money into that stuff. Uh, university endowment funds, uh, all kinds of financial entities, uh, uh, national church bodies have funds that they put into different things. And the effort is to try and get that out, just like we did this with South Africa and apartheid decades ago. And that effort is underway now. Code Pink, a woman-based peace organization in the States, uh, is working on the divestment. And also regarding the climate crisis, there's been a huge amount of pressure uh, to pull money from banks and insurance companies and other entities uh, out of anything that finances pipelines, oil refineries, uh, coal export, blah, 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 blah. So that, that divestment process is very powerful uh, and is growing. And we need people probably around the world to do this in their own respective countries. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to what Glenn's saying, Black Rose Investments, I believe, which is based in the U.S., uh, is a, the largest investment um, um, uh, uh, money house in the world. Uh, uh, and they're uh, very much behind this and have been for a while. So that should have an impact. Uh, Mar Marie Lord. Yeah, there is uh, also a campaign for people to, to leave uh, Royal Bank of Canada, RBC, because they're one of the main um, financial uh, supporters of the uh, oil um, industry. So there is a, quite a, I don't, I don't have a, a reference right now with me because I, I don't know what to put that here. But um, I'm sure that if you look, it's, uh, it's quite uh, powerful because it's a sign, a lot of people like, I, I, I moved to a, a credit union from the Bank of Montreal, and a lot of people are trying to move out from RBC and to say this is, uh, this is the right way to pass the message. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Uh, I see that Barbara Burkett, uh, who remains uh, muted, has at least uh, entered something on the chat box where she's referring to the bank on the bomb uh, project which she says reminds us was begun by Pax Christi and has been very active with regard to the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, I remember seeing something that I believe Don't Bank on the Bob produced, which was a list of the various corporations um, that uh, are, have bloody hands, so to speak, that are involved with nuclear weapons. Uh, do you remember, Barbara? You can nod, or if you want to unmute yourself, let's see what happens. Um, the because uh, uh, I, if we could find the reference to that, people might find it useful. Uh, am I correct in believing it was Bet Don't Bank of the Bomb that produced that list of of companies that we should try to pressure, or else if they don't obey us, we should leave them and you know spank them. Yes, yeah, so they they did, um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I haven't looked at the site for a while, but I assume the list is still there. As I remember, uh, just um, following Mary Lorick's uh, comment, um, the uh, Royal Bank was one of the better guys <laughs> on the list, uh, better than some of the other banks. But um, anyway. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay. Um, now I see that David Miller has a comment here. David, you can speak. So why don't you say what you've put in the chat box? Robert Howell in New Zealand. Where are you, David? Uh, this structuring the ESG, what are you talking about? Uh, okay. I'm trying not to interrupt the flow of conversation. There was a discussion of uh, ethical investment 
which abbreviates to ESG, uh, that Mary Grow, uh, I think, was talking about. So I stuck in a notice that my friend in New Zealand has written a six page paper and I've given his email address mm -hmm. because I don't want to hand over a paper that he's still rewriting. Okay. Uh, and also don't bank on the bomb. I stuck that address in there too, so people can look it up. Excellent. Well, good. Everybody but I don't think it's my job to be interrupting everybody who's talking saying, I know, I know. Uh, that's why I use chat. Well, yes, but it's fine if you if people do chime in because I, I, I think uh, if we all uh, add to something that you've just heard somebody else say, um, it's like a real conversation would be, so feel free. Well, I, I feel that, that there is a real conversation going on and I'm delighted just to, to listen to most of it without interrupting. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to scold. I'm waiting for your, uh, for your, to put in chat, uh, something about Pastor Joseph's organization so that we could look that up. Uh, Adam will probably be able to do that, won't you, Adam? Yes, yeah, so I'll track that down now. My apologies for the delay. Uh, I think it's Reached Unreached Millions. Is that the correct name, Joseph? Uh, well, I don't know whether you can answer. Joseph, can you hear us? I don't think Joseph can hear us. Yeah, that is his email, Reached Unreached Millions, or something like that. And uh, he, his organization must have a similar title. Um, but I know I got an email from him uh, several today because he's been struggling with his computer. Yeah, I, I oh, can great, say man. something. A, a few minutes ago, Barbara mentioned the TPNW the, in the chat, mm -hmm. uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And earlier in the chat, if you were to scroll way up, you'll see where uh, there had been a reference to nuclear weapons before. And just yesterday, I posted to my blog, and I have the link in the chat if you scroll way up, of a one hour interview, TV interview that I did. Um, and I just posted to the blog along with a thorough summary of what we said. I have a very, very well-informed guest whom I interview for an hour and we build a solid case explaining why the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is sensible, is what needs to happen. It is very much a grassroots bottom up thing. 51 nations have ratified this treaty now it went into effect last Friday, the 22nd, for those 20, for those 52 or 51 nations, and we expect more nations to be joining there. This is becoming part of international law, where the global south especially is telling the global north, get rid of your nuclear weapons. And out of the 51 nations, the only two nations in the global north that have ratified it were the Vatican, which ratified it the same day it became available for ratification and Ireland, which was very prompt. But the just like with the climate crisis, the global south has really been leading the way and the global north has been dragging its feet. And so on this treaty to abolish nuclear weapons, the leadership has been coming from the global south and they are pressuring the nine nations that have nuclear weapons to get rid of them. We have been, I, I live in the States, we have been violating the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty for half a century. The grand bargain in the Non-Proliferation Treaty back from 1970 was the nations that do not have nuclear weapons promise never to acquire them, and the nations that do have nuclear weapons promise to promptly eliminate them. Half a century later, the nations uh, that have nuclear weapons are ramping up a new nuclear arms race and the Global South says, enough is enough. And this treaty is powerful. So scroll up in the blog, you'll see this. Uh, and it, we make a solid case that this is practical. This is in, just in line with efforts to abolish previous kinds of weapons of mass destruction, landmines, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and now nuclear weapons need to be next. So contact me if you want information about that or see the, the uh, material I, I posted to my blog uh, that if you could scroll up in the chat, you'll see it there. Thanks. You know, Glenn, maybe we should talk you and I about having uh, you put some of your uh, previous uh, talk shows on our uh, uh, channel, on our YouTube channel. Uh, we can do that. Let's let's talk outside of this meeting. Yeah, right. and, uh, we, we can certainly do that. 
Uh, yeah. We do have permission with the TV station where I produce these that we can post these elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so we can certainly do that. Thanks. Good. Okay, I see we have a newcomer here, Ellen Thomas. Hello, Ellen, welcome. Hi, I'm sorry I'm late. I just saw your message and uh, joined as quickly as I could. I hope that I can watch it. But it are you, not only you are recording us, it. Not only watch it, but we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you're up to. Well, I'm with Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, I have been working since 1984 for a world without nuclear weapons. I've joined WILF in, in 2004, but I was part of the vigil in front of the White House for many years. Oh, <laughs> you know, he's already put up a question. I see Adam Wynn has in the chat box, he said, Ellen, Ellen Thomas, are you the Ellen Thomas associated with the White House Peace Vigil? Yes. <laughs> Good for you. Not many of us have that. I can't say I've ever picketed the White House. You can't get close enough to it now, can you? They put up this big. <laughs> well, fan. I think I think I, I I live in North Carolina now, but I think that I'm hopeful that uh, that things will change now that we have Biden in there. But I would like to mention here. Uh, there's a bill that's about to be reintroduced into Congress, into the House of Representatives, that Eleanor Holmes Norton has introduced ever since 1994, every session, as, as a result of a voter initiative that we brought in 1993. It's called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then last session, we had eight co-sponsors. It was entitled H.R. 2419. And you can read more about it and access the, the, um, te the information about the bill at prop1.org, P-R-O-P number one dot O-R-G. P-R-O-P number one dot O-R-G. And I will, I will put that in the chat. Put that in the chat. We, I'm sure people will want to check that out that is uh now do you have the slightest possibility of getting anybody in congress to vote for your bill well first we need to get them to co-sponsor so i'm asking that people contact your representative and ask them please to co-sponsor and they don't have to wait for a number they should directly contact ms norton's office and say that they would like to be put on the bill when it's introduced because uh i think one of the reasons it doesn't get very far is is norton is not a full-fledged representative so if she has some support at the beginning last session jim mcgovern of of massachusetts uh co-sponsored as soon as she introduced it uh Pe beatrice finn of of ICANN was there the day that she introduced it inter interestingly enough and uh, Barbara uh, Lee of California signed on this this last time. John Lewis signed on five times. Before really? Five. It's it. The thing that's important about this bill is that it provides solutions. Mm. It isn't just saying abolish nuclear weapons. It's saying abolish nuclear weapons along with the other nuclear powers. Do it together. Um, and it's saying support the TPNW, of course, mm -hmm. but it's also saying earmark the money that's currently um, earmarked for nuclear weapons instead for shutting down and cleaning up the nuclear weapons industry yeah. and transforming the arms industries to producing carbon-free, nuclear-free energy and other human needs. So it's, it's saying these people don't have to lose their jobs Mm. The taxpayers will pay for the companies to retool and the employees to retrain or, or wait until the, the factories are retooled. And uh, so that there's a transition that's, that's painless. You know, if the taxpayers can pay for nuclear weapons, they can certainly pay to transform the nuclear weapons industry. So it's a very important piece of legislation. It's the money for the Green New Deal. And uh, people need to know about it. I've been trying to get people to know about it since 19. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely brilliant because I've been saying for ages that every time we open our mouth and say, get rid of nuclear this or get rid of that, whatever, we ought to say, and here's what we ought to do instead. Yeah. 
We want to spend that money on something and show how you could take the, because there's a lot of it has to do with jobs, you know, take that money and put it into something else that will have also create jobs right away, you know? And, yeah. and if you're doing the linking those two, and then you can say, well, it's the, there's a connection between things like global warming or all of these infrastructural improvements that the U S needs where you bridges have fallen <laughs> into disrepair and so on. So I think that that connection is really, it, I don't see how people are going to vote for disarmament unless they know that they're, they're going to get something real out of it. If their job especially depends on it, they need to know that. That's wonderful. Glenn Anderson. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the economic connection is powerful, but the military industrial complex has been holding local communities hostage uh, by, by playing up the jobs angle. But research has been showing for decades, economists have proven that if you take a billion dollars, you can create more jobs by putting it into health, housing, education, other things that we really need instead of putting it into military weapons. But the weapons manufacturers fund the campaigns of people in Congress and, and, and they hold local communities hostage. And when the B-1 bomber was going through Congress, the General Dynamics, the prime contractor, arranged for subcontracts and sub 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 subcontracts to get into every one of the 435 congressional districts in the nation as a way to mobilize people for funding. And in 1976 and 77, I did extensive research into showing how military spending actually hurts the economy, not just in the budget trade-off yes. way, but also it hurts how the economy functions as an economy. It distorts and perverts the economy in very unhealthy ways. And in about 1980, I worked with some other people to do some organizing and push some statewide legislation in Washington state toward converting our state's economy away from being a war economy toward being a peace economy. We don't have time to explain all of that here, but the economics is really on our side and we need to get big money out of the political campaigns and we need to help people understand that, that part of the reason why we have so much unemployment is because we put weapons into, or put our money into military weapons instead of into things that are good for the economy and actually produce. Uh, and, yes, Rose, and I think Barbara, uh, you have your hand up too. Let's have Rose first and then Barbara, yeah. Okay, Ellen, I'm Canadian, so I'm not in a position to do anything to help you with your uh, uh, very interesting and important uh, uh, bill, but uh, mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know if, if uh, um, uh, John Kerry's been approached on this in any way. I mentioned earlier before you came on that I heard him interviewed by Fareed Zakir on CNN today, and he did acknowledge the nuclear industry and uh, need to ramp down on it or, or address uh, nuclear proliferation in, in some way. So he's your new climate uh, um, czar. Um, wouldn't he be supportive of what you're doing? I don't know. Ed Markey, for example, who is definitely supportive of, of um, reducing the arms race, and you know, he's but he's an incrementalist, and I think John Kerry is an incrementalist too. That's the problem with so many yeah. of legislators is they just don't have the vision to see that it's possible to do to to proclaim that this is what we're going to do. I don't understand why. Um, I think it's because they want to be reelected. Now, John Kerry doesn't have to worry about being reelected, and it would be, it's a good idea to be in touch with him. I think. Thank you. Um, I've I've asked Ed Markey to introduce it into the Senate several times. I've also asked um, Jamie Raskin, but I haven't spoken to him personally. Uh, you know, he's he's heading up the impeachment thing right now, so I don't know how how easy it would be to get through to him in Maryland. But we do need to get it into the Senate as well. And one of the problems is that it gets shuffled into uh, the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs sub uh, committees, and then they just sit on them and it never gets to the floor for a vote. So the only way that this is ever going to get anywhere is if a lot of people are are raising a ruckus about it and and, and letting the members of the House and the Senate know about it. Um, 
you know, just having having a few people get in touch with their representatives isn't enough. And, you know, also another thing that can be done, of course, you're in Canada, but you probably know people in the United States, so you can tell people about it, right? That is true. Yeah. Not as much as we should. I'm afraid there. <laughs> that's a big story for me because I'm a dual citizen and I feel split right down the middle. Anyway, Barbara Burkett. Barbara, you're you're muted. Yeah. And uh, just a brief comment that uh, in terms of trying to promote. Uh, getting rid of the nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I think um, you, you can always say that for the people involved with nuclear um, uh, scientific knowledge, there will be employment for them for centuries trying to safeguard the waste material. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's one group of people that need not necessarily be out of a job. That's right. Uh, horrible thought, Barbara. <laughs> That's true. It's <laughs> <That's> awful. <laughs> it's terrible. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. That's well, true. Well, and the the scientific people can just be they can be paid to do research into clean energy. There's no reason why they have to continue to do this. That's true. You know, oddly, Ellen, I had a conversation with Jonathan Granoff the other day. I did a talk show with him. Do you know Jonathan? No. Well, he has this outfit called the Global Security Institute, which is uh, right near the UN. And I was asking him why it is that the Green New Deal doesn't include uh, anything about militarism. And they have all these great ideas for how we could make people healthier and have more money and all of these, you know, the environment ought to be better and everything would be wonderful, except they don't say, let's cut back on the military. And I, I, I was puzzled by that because, of course, the author, uh, the co-author of the Green New Deal proposal was Ed Markey. And Ed Markey has been for, I think, 50 years, probably the most uh, fervent anti-nuclear weapons uh, legislator in, in Washington. I don't know how long he's been in Washington, but he's been there as a member of, uh, was in Congress for a long time before he came, became a senator. And... Um, so how come he didn't put uh, military in the Green New Deal? And and Jonathan said, well, he was right. He said, you want to you want to put if you want your Green New Deal to pass, you don't want to mix in a lot of other things that are not going to uh, be winning uh, issues for them. That they that it would make it much much harder to uh, pass the Green New Deal. Of course, they're not going to pass it as one thing anyway. But uh, you know, piece by piece. If uh, it's sort of, uh, had, if it includes the nuclear uh, weapons issue. Um, also, they don't, they don't deal with the nuclear power issue either. That's probably true. I hadn't even noticed that. I, I was aware of the fact. Okay. That <clears throat> this is a crucial error, I think, mm -hmm. because if we're, we're in a crisis right now, the species is in a crisis. I mean, nobody's, we all know that. So, to be incremental, doing the incrementalism at this point is insanity, I think. Yeah. What we need is a f firm foundation on what we've done that has created this mess and what we need to do to change it. And I, and I just don't think that it's, I mean, of course there are differences of approach and everything, but I don't think fundamentally in view of the crisis, I don't think it's so damn complex. And, and, to, and to not address the issue of militarism, it, you know, I mean, that's just like, whew, what do you expect? What do you, do you expect anything to, new to come from that? I'll just interject one little, one little personal point here. In the 60s, when you know, we were, it was at two minutes to midnight. Now it's a hundred seconds to midnight. And I, I, I wasn't going to have children when I was a young woman, because why the hell would I in the sixties? And fortunately I fell in love and I mean, I've got incredible kids, 
But now that I'm, it's a hundred seconds to midnight. I've been, I've been involved in setting up peace a action committees everywhere I've lived, and 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 I I have to say that it, it's failed. What I've done has failed. But that's okay because I mean I want to face what didn't get addressed, and certainly and in the Green New Deal, my God, that shocks. That shocks me so much. I had no idea that that was missing. Uh, that That is a shocking lapse. Have people, Ellen, uh, commented on it much in your circle? The, the absence of any militarism or, or nuclear power from the Green New Deal? Um, well, the, the nuclear power, yes, the militarism, it, it's a point that I hadn't, it hadn't registered with me either, but, but um, certainly Wilf is concerned about militarism as well as, as nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's definitely something that needs to be dealt with. And in order to, as the UN, when it first, uh, in, in its first utterance it it was talking about ab abolishing nuclear weapons and, and and general and complete disarmament around the world and in order to get rid of nuclear weapons we do need to uh, it's going to be really hard to get countries to completely disarm uh, probably for the next i don't know who can who can predict how long it'll take before people will finally realize you don't have to have armies and but, um, but to cut back on it, I, it, I think that we have to talk about the economics of it because it's the economics of, of the arms race, all of the arms races is really destructive. So, uh, you know, people are more interested in money than they are in <laughs> survival, survival, I think. I have two different shows coming up that are worth talking about in, sort of in this context. Uh, one of them is I've got a, a guy in Tokyo who is going to get up at 2.30 or 3 in the morning to talk to me because my show is at noon or around the noon hour, and it's the wrong time of day to be in Tokyo. But uh, he is concerned because the, according to him, if I'm not misquoting him or misinterpreting him, the Japanese government is indicating an interest in coming in under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Mm -hmm. And the reason for doing it is uh, now. I mean, why now? You know, they haven't until now. It's because there's some interest in the Biden administration of um, be adopting a no first use policy, the U.S. adopting that. And that would mean that it would apply to all of the, what is it, extended deterrence, that is the protection of other countries under the so-called umbrella. Um, and uh, uh, Japan doesn't want that to happen. So in order to keep it from happening, they're talking about joining, somehow becoming a party to the, uh, the nuclear umbrella, uh, uh, being under it in some sense. And, and so, uh, of course, there's, a, there's an effort to, to try to uh, forestall that. So later this week, I'll have a conversation about that with him. Uh, the other thing is um, I uh, am in touch with uh, some people I, I, I know in Moscow at the uh, USA Canada Institute. And I used to go to Moscow, well, every year at least, uh, for many years. But... Um, I don't have that much contact anymore, but uh, the head of the USA Canada Institute is a man named Sergei Rogov. And uh, Sergei has now retired at age 65, he's supposed to, but he's not giving up. He's doing a lot more work than ever. His specialty is Soviet military policy and Russian, of course, successor Russian military policy. And I've had him on my talk show before um, but uh, this time in retirement, he's been active in creating uh, a new initiative to uh, try to stop the problems, the nuclear issue uh, tensions between NATO and Russia. So he has uh, he convened a meeting of some kind and he um, 
And they wrote a, a, a document with a whole bunch of uh, proposals, recommendations for how to change, reduce the tensions and, and stop the increasing risk of nuclear war between NATO and Russia. And um, so this is a nice big document. They have 146 signatories and these are not trivial people. These are all very high level, very influential people who, uh, you know, internationally famous, important people, 146 names of them. So he's got this document and uh, my friend says, you know, you should get to Sergei and do a talk show with him. So that's one of the things that I will be doing is uh, trying to set that up. And I'll have some other people uh, who know about NATO or and uh, US policy as well uh, to, um, to participate in that conversation. Uh, that, I don't have the date for that yet. My guess is, no, I won't even guess. I don't know when it'll happen, but uh, uh, I think it will happen. Uh, so be on, on the lookout for that. Um, yeah, does anybody have anything to add to what I've just said about, especially about all of this effort going on in Canada and elsewhere, but largely I've noticed it's been remarkable in Canada since, since the TPNW came into force a few days ago, a week or two ago, um, there has been, uh, in preparation for that, there was a lot of activity among NGOs to try to get the Canadian government to move on that and to join the, the TPNW, which is not as unrealistic a hope as it would have been six or eight months ago. At least that's my impression. Barbara, you please uh, probably know more about this. Oh, yeah. Call it more closely than I do. But any, I'd like your comments, other people comments on how Canada is responding, but Canada softened for a long time. They just sort of sneered almost at the whole idea of uh, joining the TPNW or having anything to do with it. It was a silly idea, et cetera. Well, they don't talk that way quite anymore. And I understand that there's a lot of softening going on in Washington too, not toward certainly not toward joining the TPNW yet by a long shot, but uh, things like the no first use policy or there are various ways, cutting back on expenditures for uh, nuclear uh, modernization. There's a, a, a growing uh, possibility of all of that, I believe in Washington. So I know that Ellen has, I'm sure you can add to that. I think Barbara, May and maybe some everybody else have some reaction to what I've said. Well, I don't know that I'm going to add a lot to what you said. Um, certainly, I think that the tone has changed. Uh, whether much of the substance is, uh, as far as government policy has changed, uh, I'm not sure. But there, there will certainly be much more pressure on them to change. Um, and... Um, this um, a news conference with various party members on the subject and and very prominent people, um, including former um, disarmament ambassadors and so on, um, you know, supporting the idea. I, I, uh, I'm hopeful that there, there will be change. Excellent. Okay. Anything else? Yes, Rose. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say something about uh, NATO and and um, uh, militarism. I've participated in two or three uh, uh, conferences involving uh, a NATO policy, and there seems to be uh, uh, quite an emphasis on uh, redefining themselves, and they seem to be very concerned about climate change and energy that's being absorbed uh, in their operations and so on, or, or squandered uh, carbon emissions in one way or another. And uh, 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 I, I get the impression that there's a lot of emphasis emphasis on redefining the, the meaning of national security and sort of pointing in the direction of being more responsive to, to local crises of one kind or another. So um, uh, any reactions to those trends, if, if you agree that they're real? Or, or how useful might they be uh, uh, 
Um, in, I mean, we've got uh, not only the the national emergencies that come up from time to time because of of the climate changing. Uh, we have COVID. We've got military people who are involved here in Canada helping with the distribution of the vaccines. For uh, whether that's a good idea or not uh, um, is is controversial. But uh, somebody has to do it and. And uh, uh, it's not necessarily NATO, it's our Canadian armed forces, but uh, I, I just uh, wonder about this, the, 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 the uh, uh, positivity, if, if any, of, of the military redefining themselves and, and uh, refocusing their energy and priorities. You, you raise a really good point about that. Um, and I'm quite curious if the military is also being... Um, employed for this because of their experience implementing kind of large-scale programs. I heard down in the States that there was a disastrous uh, rollout of vaccines, either in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh with a civilian group that was leading it that had no experience in this. And now that that city, let me just double check, it might have been, it was definitely in Pennsylvania, I just can't remember the city name, but they have to go back now and redo weeks of work because of the civilian group that had no experience mm -hmm. with this large kind of program rollout. So I'm very curious if that plays any role, but you raise a very good point about whether it will actually be redefining the perception of the military through their assistance with this vaccine program. Another thing I, I believe that um, might um, be a factor is the uh, um, uh, the um, siege on the White House on January January sixth, and and the analysis being done by the CIA and the, the FBI um, in terms of how many uh, uh, military people or or law enforcement people were involved, retired officers of one kind or another, and uh, that, uh, quite apart from, of course, the Proud Boys and Q and on and so on that uh, that needs to be addressed from a, a national security point of view or global security for that matter. So there are lots of challenges coming up in terms of, of uh, um, uh, law and order, I suppose, if we believe it's important in order to facilitate peace. Mm -hmm. It's a, a curious thing to me that we haven't talked about that event in, on January the 6th. It, it has to be the most astounding thing that's happened all year and, uh, and it poses all kinds of challenges and questions about what the rest of the world should be doing about it, but uh, we haven't talked about it. Does anybody have any burning thoughts that, uh, that, that, uh, of what we should be doing or worrying about, how much we should worry? Ellen, how do people think about it in, in, uh, in WILP, for example? Well, we're really glad that Trump isn't president anymore. <laughs> sure, but, but how about that storming of the Capitol? Uh, do you expect that this uh, Trumpism is going to continue and that there will be a continued need for, for example, if you, if you have a, a vigil at the White House, you can't even get near the White House anymore, can you? Yeah, um, on the north. They have to be su uh, surrounded by fences and things for security reasons. Is it, are you concerned that things like that may continue? No, I'm not concerned. It could it could continue. I'm not. I I'm hopeful that it won't. But as far as the yes, I think that it depends. It depends on what happens when with the impeachment trial. If if the Republicans continue to act like a bunch of cowards, then it could it it could continue to be a serious problem because the the um, the. Uh, white supremacists and the QAnon and those folks, uh, they're going to feel like they can get away with it. And so will Trump. Trump will be able to run for, for um, president again, and he's going to spend all of his energy and money on trying to do it. And he's going to continue to whip the, the right, right wing into a frenzy. So yes, it could be a real problem. We might have continue to have problems with it. Mm -hmm. um, but if if the Republicans um, do impeach him, I think that eventually it's going to die down. Rose? Well, um, Ellen, do you really think that um, the uh, forces that uh, were uh, galvanized to support him in one way uh, are going to just uh, uh, quit if uh, Trump doesn't win again? Uh, uh, because he has mobilized uh, 
a uh, number of people into believing that they've made some gains. Uh, or uh, I, I, I know there are also counter arguments saying that um, unless a charismatic figure like uh, Trump is around, um, they will um, um, probably not uh, be as successful or as, as united as, as they were or um, in, um, in uh, storming the Capitol. Yeah, I, I think that Trump has done some serious damage to the Republican Party, and I don't know that they'll ever completely recover from it. Um, so, uh, But then again, social media is doing so much to fuel uh, the problem. Right. That's been said over and over again, and uh, uh, so that has to be fixed as well, whether Trump... Uh, uh, runs again or not. Uh, yeah, it has to be fixed, but it, it better not be fixed by, um, you know, putting troops out in the streets to enforce the, the mask uh, rules and or by um, shutting down the, the Facebook and, and stuff for, for everybody, because then that will feed into the right wing's um, allegations that, you know, everything is terrible. So they have to. We have to walk very carefully um, through this minefield. I think. Yeah, but the uh, you know the roots of the difficulty that that the whole Trump administration has has revealed are of long standing. The the, the fundamental racism in the United States. I'm a for. I am also a dual citizen, and what's going what goes on down there, it just it breaks one's heart. But the thing is that until those, it seems to me that until we begin to find realistic ways of reduce, of addressing the roots of the problem, which is inherent, I mean, the, the country was based on, was founded on, in, on slavery, for God's sakes. Right. And, and we, we have people who are addressing that issue God knows, I, I mean, I have a greatest respect for Reverend Barker, for example, and others who are striding into the Malay with some creativity. But I think, and I think that's what go, it's going to take. It's going to take really creative thinking and not not thinking that you, that you know what the answers are. Yeah. I think you meant to say you have respect for Reverend Barber, not disrespect. But it was oh, a, did I say? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my goodness! Thank you for picking that one up. Yes, yeah. I have the greatest respect. Yeah. Yeah. The racism is definitely a, a, a very important issue that we ha we are going to have to continue to work with, and not just you know just for because of the Black Lives Matter movement, but we're going to have to really seriously work on that. And in Wilt right now, we're going through a, a time where there are some people who are challenging Wilt because we're primarily white, and mm. and and we need to uh, we need to change that. We need to to ha have embrace people from other cultures and other, you know. And it isn't that we don't embrace. It's just that we don't reach out. And the way to reach out, of course, is to get involved with, with other people who are working on these issues and, and then in, invite them in. Inviting without getting involved in their issues doesn't do any good. Uh, how many uh, Republicans do you have in Wilp? I don't know. Probably <laughs> not very many. <laughs> I wouldn't think so, but, you know, it'd be uh, interesting to... Uh... I do know that a lot of Republicans have become independents in the last few couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I've been reading yeah. thousands and thousands of people have left the Republican Party. Well, but I think the thing that worries me is that it, if anything, I mean, it looks like maybe the Republicans may split in two because the two sides are so uh, opposed to each other now. But if anything happens, it's going to be that the the uh, crazies will win. They were they're they're the bigger they're still almost all Republicans believe that Trump won the election. Apparently, I mean, by polls, uh, it's just weird. It is weird. It's so strange. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't want to disagree with uh, anything that Joe said, but uh, you know, I think it's not just the U.S. It, 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 it 
true. The U.S. Uh, racism yeah. is is a unique phenomenon that you know doesn't have any quite anything quite parallel to it in other countries. But the rest of the world still has all this populist movement, and I think it's a strong reaction against um, it, you, elitism of some kind. Yeah. Um, the sense that even you know they don't want science. They don't want to believe in in COVID because it's promoted by scientists and scientists are elites and, and, you know, they don't, <laughs> it, it's sort of like, um, uh, the, being, dumbing, the dumbing down of the population through yeah the claim yeah. for the right to, I was just watching another show about the rise of uh, cancel culture, which is a term that I was, you know, I've been retired from being a professor a number of years, 23 years now. So I hadn't been fully aware, at, hardly aware at all of the, the rise of a, of a tradition which is against free speech, against, uh, you know, free inquiry, uh, in favor of, um, you know, identity politics, where you uh, appoint people to jobs on the basis of their, their, their identity, their gender, or their ethnicity, or their something, color, or something. And you, and I, I knew that there was affirmative action, but my God, it's apparently become the main criterion now for hiring people and promoting people and evaluating their research proposals, their grant proposals, and they even fire people for saying, for, for not uh, using his, her, she uh, uh, pronouns. And uh, it, it's really much worse than anything I'd discovered. All of that has to be a reaction against some kind of notion that the elites are running the world and education and professional people and the people in the knowledge industry and the, and the scientists and the, the you know, mm -hmm. space researchers and stuff. All of these people uh, have uh, power that other people think they, they should have and they want to get back. And I don't know what to do about that because it's in every, it's not just in the U.S. It's really. No, no, and I wouldn't have, I, I, I didn't mean to imply that. Oh, okay. That it was only in the United States. Oh. Heavens no, I would never, because the, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a psychological process of othering. And, you know, there again, we, to understand it takes, it's hard work. Yeah. I hijacked the conversation again. I beg your pardon, Ellen. <laughs> well, we and have. And as far as hopeful for the Biden administration, I think that they they he seems to to have made some very good um, moves at the beginning here. Um, my my problem is with the with Congress. You know, I th I think that uh -huh. I, I'm just wondering how far he's going to be able to go with it. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Congress has a tendency to to get in the way of what of, of ideas. And so yeah. I, I, I hope, I don't believe, but I hope that, <laughs> that we will make progress. I hope so. Do you have the conviction, which I've cer certainly seen people hint at, although I think everybody says they don't have proof yet, that people inside Congress were party to and assisted in this riot. Yes, I do. It is really true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think will happen if they if they find out for sure who who did and who didn't? Well, I'm hopeful that they'll kick them out. They can. Uh -huh. Okay. And that will be a message to others that they shouldn't do that sort of thing. Thank I think uh, the, the argument that there have to be consequences. I completely believe. Yeah, I was just saying the, the only thing that Biden can do is if he really pushes for uh, a lot of social uh, changes and, uh, you know, like taxing more the rich, etc. There was someone saying that uh, the, the, the ultra rich uh, earned 40 percent more of their fortune just the last year. And, uh, you know, the, the, the good way if they could be taxed over that amount of money, I mean, they, they could do a lot more programs to, to help. But education and, uh, you know, even like changing uh, the, the 13th Amendment, uh, that's always a problem with, uh, with black people in the state. So but if he's his only way to really uh, 
deter all the Republicans from, from going back to Trump is uh, if Biden is successful. If he really makes uh, the changes that he wants to make. Uh, I don't think that uh, the, um, the impeachment will go forward because they need two thirds of, uh, of the uh, senators and uh, the Republicans won't go there. Mitch McConnell is already kind of uh, stopped talking uh, and is uh, so slowly sliding back in his, in his old ways. And uh, Trump is still holding court in Florida. So I think that uh, this is not going to go away. I think we were lucky that Trump was uh, such uh, <laughs> lack of intelligence because if he had, I mean, he would have been usually more successful and he probably would have earned a second term. So this is really uh, very worrying. I think that we have the same thing happening in Canada. If you look in Alberta, they have also the same, uh, some of the same uh, points of view. And uh, it's the same thing for us. I mean, if our uh, government doesn't act to uh, help people to make a, a more, less difference between the ultra rich and the ultra poor, that we're really working for that, I don't think that we're going to be able to, uh, to to prevent problems. And I think that COVID, especially with the vaccine now, has revealed how easy it is for countries to go back to, you know, uh, dragging uh, things in their favor. And I don't care what's happened anywhere else. Uh, so we, it, it's always the temptation. It's always what people go back in times of difficulties. And with climate change, there's going to be even more difficulties mm. uh, that are coming up. So I think that we really need to push towards uh, more more changes and uh, you know and propose also a, a new vision because that's I think that's what we're lacking mm -hmm. you know is is what would the new world look like what do we want to happen what is it going to look like on an emotional level on a realistic level I'd like to say thank you for inviting me thank you for thank you. coming it's wonderful to have have friends in the White House my god <laughs> that's wonderful all right Ellen thank you so much Bye, everybody.